let's sing a song. We haven't done that for a good while. Wednesday night, uh, uh, we need to sing the praises to the Lord every once in a while. Page 239 in your hymn book. Page 239, Jesus is coming again. Boy, we hope that's before this song is over, don't we? Page 239, marvelous message we bring, glorious carols we sing. All right, you have it, page 239. Those who are online, we welcome you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. And we are going to have a study tonight on the, the future events found in the Bible. Our guest speaker, Jason Knapp, is speaking for us tonight. Jesus is coming again. Let's sing this together. Ready? Let's have a word of prayer together, and then you may be seated, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we look forward to the return of Jesus. We hope that it will be very soon. But until that hour, Father, we pray that you would guide us and help us to be good representatives of you. We pray that we'll be able to lead someone to Christ this week. We ask, Father, that you would bless our church with growth. We pray that you would help us as we strive to get this building project uh, started. God, that you would just work and all the contractors and uh, just father bring that about quickly and may it be to your honor and glory and uh, lord bless these folks who are coming out tonight and strengthen them we pray for those in our church who have some physical ailments that you'll give them healing and father we love you and glad to serve you in jesus name amen all right thank you, you may be seated and uh, we're delighted to have some friends here ron and nita thank you for being here tonight uh, we're surprised to have friends uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say things like that. Uh, should I, Karen? I used to tease Karen, but now I have new people to tease here. So. <laughs> All right, I'm an addict. I'm an addict. I'm going to quit, I promise, one day. <laughs> so you've heard that before. But anyway, we're glad that you're here tonight, and thank you for those who are watching online. And we just ask that this to be a blessing and help to you. Okay, you, do you have the little handout? And did this get put on the website? Do you know, brother? Oh, uh, I, I meant to do that and didn't do it. Hey, your, your microphone has fallen, brother. So, it, all right. Very good. Okay, take your Bibles, please. And Jason, if you come, let me get you unmuted and mute this, and you'll be good. I'm on now. There I, oh, good. Good evening, everyone. Well, I can hear myself. Well, thank you for coming out. Hello, my name is Paris Abraham from Levant Ministries. Isn't that nice? In the Middle East. Hold on a second. Really this guy's serving in the Middle East. I, God bless him. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the bad side of having a, uh, a Bible, you know, on your, on your cell phone or on a tablet. You get ads. 
in there for all kinds of different things. Before we start, I have a, a, a few announcements. We're talking about the end times. And of course, if you discuss the end times and especially the signs, what to look for before Jesus returns, because we don't know the day or the hour. Not even the angels know that, all right? And Jesus says only our Heavenly Father knows. And of course, now that he's in heaven and is one with the Heavenly Father, of course, Jesus knows. But the fascinating thing is, is that there are a few really uh, pretty positive signs in, uh, in Scripture. And one of them is a war, uh, an invasion, as it were, of Israel out of the north by a coalition of surprise, Russia and Iran, and five Arab states that are going to support them. They're going to come down out of the north, and it's going to be a very limited, short-lived, or is it short-lived? Short-lived, short-lived. Sure, yeah, it's going to be just a short nuclear war with some uh, nukes being used actually in Israel itself. And a marvelous teaching, a little plug for Jared, our drummer, who is not here this evening, but he's teaching this. He just started last Sunday. So if you're not in a particular life group and you'd like to go to a teaching on the end times on Ezekiel 38 and 39, the upcoming war between Russia, Iran, and Israel, then drop in on his teaching. And I have his, I read his, his little synopsis here, and it's excellent. Okay, a little more, a little more uh, housekeeping. We got some questions at the end of last week's uh, uh, Bible teaching on the return of Jesus, part one. And tonight, of course, is the return of Jesus, part two. And... Uh, one was from uh, Sammy, and it was actually an excellent question. And Sammy, please keep the questions coming. I love these. I love these. It's on Psalm 83. And if you haven't read Psalm 83 in, uh, in a while, uh, it discusses a future uh, conflict or war between Israel and a coalition of 10 Arab states. And uh, a lot of stuff was written online, a lot of people doing blogs and things like that, trying to tie this war with uh, future end times events like Ezekiel 38 and 39 with Russia and Iran and everyone else. Unfortunately, it appears, uh, at least to me and several others, um, some really <laughs> Bible commenta commentators that are uh, really quite versed in this, that this event has already occurred. You're gonna read about 10 Arab states that invade Israel and right at the very beginning, in fact, actually it's in the, the second verse, the Arab states say that we are going to stop Israel from becoming a nation, from becoming a nation. And that's kind of the key to this event. It occurred at midnight, on May the 15th, 1948, about nine hours after uh, Israel declared itself a sovereign state, the sovereign state of Israel. And these 10 nations, including uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Arabia, Saudi Arabia, we also had uh, Egypt, and they, for four years, went up against Israel, trying to literally destroy Israel and wipe it off the map. It didn't work. It didn't work again in 1967 at the Six-Day War, in which uh, through, I guess you could call it almost a prophetic event, Israeli intelligence got information that they were going to be invaded by Egypt and the Egyptian Air Force was going to totally obliterate uh, Israel. And at the time, Israel only had about six airplanes. That was it. And, and they were actually brought across the border in pieces and inside trucks. And then they were reassembled there. And then some World War II pilots flew these planes. And because they had this advanced intelligence of the night before it was going to occur, they went ahead on their own and they attacked Egypt and destroyed every single Egyptian fighter plane and bomber on the ground at all three of their major airfields before they even could attack Israel. So that was the beginning of the end, so to speak, of the, 
Six Day War. If you get a chance, there's many good documentaries on it, on, uh, of course, on television, cable TV. Last but not least, interesting question brought up by Derek on the two witnesses of, uh, that appear in Revelation chapter 11. We talked last week that these two witnesses uh, actually preach for three and a half years at the beginning of the seven year, we call it tribulation period, but it's actually a treaty period. It's three and a half years of peace and they're in Jerusalem and they're preaching that the Messiah is on his way, that Jesus is coming and to repent of your sins. And then of course at the three and a half year period, the Antichrist kills these two witnesses and then in front of the whole world, they ascend into heaven after three and a half days. Now, we know for sure that one of them is Elijah. And we know that because in Malachi 4, verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5, Malachi says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So he prophesied the word of God that Elijah would be one of those witnesses. In fact, the Jewish leadership at the time of Jesus knew this. And in John, the Gospel of John, when John the Baptist was, was preaching the baptism of repentance so that your sins could be remitted, meaning forgiven, the Jewish leaders came to John the Baptist and says, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And he says, nope, I'm not him. He said, okay, you've got to be Elijah the prophet. And he says, nope, I'm not Elijah the prophet either. And he says, are you the prophet spoken of uh, by the Lord to Moses in Deuteronomy? And he said, no, I'm not him either. I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord. And so they knew that Elijah was on the way, but they didn't know who Elijah was and how he would show up. Now, Derek asked a great question. Who's the second witness? Right? We don't know. We don't know. Um, Derek, Pastor Ken, myself, our bet's on Enoch. Because Enoch and Elijah are the only two that absolutely prove positive in the Bible were actually raptured, meaning taken alive off of planet Earth and ascend into heaven. Okay? So some say it could be Moses because... Uh, one of the prophets calls fire down from heaven, like Moses did, you know, against Pharaoh and things like this, and similar type uh, plagues. We don't know, and really, it doesn't make any difference because we're not going to be here. And if I may speak a little Southern, we ain't going to be here. Okay. All right. Last, I have to bring this up because one of you will, okay, as you read... Uh, your New Testament, um, and, and we're going to see a particular quote here that, that we're going to let's see. You're going to notice the word worshipped. And my lovely wife, Linda, brought this up as I'm very speedily trying to finish up my teaching this afternoon. And she says, you spelled worship with one P. It's supposed to have two Ps. <laughs> well, very interesting because today we're going to talk about the great and awful day of the Lord, which is in the King James of 1611, Old English. And in the King James Version, worship is spelled with two Ps. But in the New King... <laughs> Linda loves that. <laughs> but in the New King James Version, using more Americanized English, it's spelled with one P. All right. And by the way, when you hear the word awful, it actually in own, old English means wonderful and absolutely fantastic. OK, not awful like we say, oh, that's awful. It's more like modern day. Two surfers are walking down the beach and they see a chick in a bikini. They go, man, she's really bad. Right. <laughs> well, she's not bad. She's probably a good Christian girl. <laughs> All right. It's just that she looks hot. Wait a minute. That's another idiom. By the way, when you start, maybe one of these years, <laughs> if I'm still here and still planted on, on, on earth, I do a teaching on why you can trust the Bible. And one of the things are the intrinsic proofs we, we call about the Bible itself. 
And we're seeing that today. Prophecy, the biggest. 3,200 prophecies that have come true with split-second absolute accuracy. The other one is, how do you know that the 66 books of the Bible shouldn't include the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Thomas, and all these other aberrant books that suddenly, mysteriously are coming to the forefront and saying these are the missing books of the Bible. Watch tonight on the Discovery Channel, right? No, they're not missing. They've actually been around since about the year 400. And the reason is because of idiom, idiomic, what are you, idioms. I'm going to forget, just go with the easy word, right, Pastor Ken? Idioms, all right? We use them today. That girl at the beach is really bad. Wow, hey, you're a cool dude, you know? Even uh, Snoopy the dog, when he puts on his sunglasses in the Peanuts cartoons, he's Joe Cool, right? But is he cold? No, he's cool. A phrase that's been around, believe it or not, since the 1920s. They've used that phrase, you're really cool, all right? So because of these special little idioms, as we call them, a word that means something else, <laughs> rather than saying she's hot or it's cool or whatever, we find that the Bible, especially the New Testament, except for the book of Matthew, which is written in Aramaic, the rest of it is written in the most exacting language that ever existed on the planet, and that is called Koine Greek. And even today, there's an expression that we have that says the Greeks have a word for it. Once again, did we see my big fat Greek wedding? Okay, every time you see the father, he's either telling you about Windex or, he's, or he's, you say a word, ah, oh, that's based on the Greek for so-and-so, right? It means exact, a particular word for a particular uh, event or thing or action, all right? So we'll see that maybe one of these days, okay? All right, and your little, your little, uh, um, form here, The Return of Jesus, Part 2. The, uh, there's one prophecy that I put in here that really stands out, and I'm going to read it to you. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 9 to verse 11. I mentioned it last, last week. These are like the, uh, these are, uh, the good old boys, personally handpicked, by the way, by Jesus. Every one of them, except one, Judas, was from the upper shore of Galilee, around the, uh, the area of, up there of Nazareth, okay, and the other cities around the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. This area was kind of a wild area. Um, it could almost be considered like Haight-Ashbury was in San Francisco in the 60s. You had a lot of artisans, sculptors, painters, and a lot of fast eddies trying to make a quick buck, all right? And among this group, you had 11 particular apostles, okay, personally picked by Jesus and given nicknames, John and James, young guys that used to like getting, probably getting fights, Okay, and he called them the sons of thunder. Okay, he called Simon Rocky, Petros. Okay, a rock that you throw to hit somebody with, probably because he was pretty well built. He was a, he was a, a fisherman. And back then, they didn't have automatic winching systems, electric winches that put your sails up. Everything had to be done with brute force. So think of Danny DeVito looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and now you've got Peter, okay? So these guys are told by Jesus, I want you to stand by, okay, an extra 10 days or so. No, he actually doesn't say so many days, but I want you to stand by in Jerusalem because you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And then about 10 days before that event occurs, okay, he's going to ascend into heaven, and what happens is, is a kind of a deer in the headlights moment for these apostles. Now, when he had spoken these things, that's Jesus, while they watched, he was taken up 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This was on the Mount of Olives. So one of these gentlemen in white, an angel, tells our, our good old boys, you know, the guys that when you, your car dies on the side of the, the road, I told you about this, and you lift up the hood, these are the kind of guys that would stand there and stare at the engine hoping that it would fix itself. And they're just standing there looking like this. And the angel says, why do you keep looking? He's coming back to this very same spot. Now this was at the Mount of Olives. And I want you to remember that because in approximately 20 minutes, you're going to see why that's important. Next, another prophecy we see in Mark 1327 on your little sheet here. Mark says, and he will send his angels and gather together his elect, that's the saints, from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. And then in Matthew, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So before the Lord returns from heaven, he's gathering all of the saints, the true believers, you guys, okay? And we're all going to come back with Jesus. Now, this is one of my, I find this is one of the most fascinating prophecies, okay? Because Jesus himself told his own disciples that he had, he's prepared a place for us in heaven, He's going to call you folks to himself. He's going to draw you to him, and we're all going to be together with him. In fact, his prayer in John chapter 17, as we found out from Pastor Ken, the real Lord's prayer, not the Lord's model prayer, our Father who art in heaven, which is in Matthew chapter 6, but in the real Lord's prayer where he's, Jesus is praying to our Heavenly Father, he says, Heavenly Father, Please make all of these that you've given to me one with us the same way you and I are one. This is pretty heavy duty. We're going to be really, really close to Jesus. So in Jesus' own words, I don't think we're going to be in one of these things like a giant stadium that you, you see for like a baseball game. We're up in the, the really cheap seats right, where you practically have to use oxygen masks, you're up so high, and we're looking down with a pair of field glasses or binoculars. I see somebody down there on the 50-yard line. Is that Jesus? I'm not sure. Honey, could you take a look? My eyesight's not that good. No, he's going to be standing right next to you. If you don't believe that, take a look at Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and you'll see a little surprise in there. When Jesus says in chapter 2, for instance, that if you just overcome these things and hang in there till the very end, I'm going to place a white stone with a name on it that's only known to you and me. Cool. All right. I can never do an imitation of the Fonz because I don't have the hair. <laughs> okay. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 we will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise up incorruptible and we shall be transformed. This, of course, is one of the prophecies like we see in Thessalonians, uh, also from the Apostle Paul, about what we call the rapture, that we're going to be taken up. Now, I'm going to give you a little... A little uh, time phase moment. Uh, one of my favorite movies starring Rod Taylor is called The Time Machine. It also has uh, Yvette Mignot, which is a, an actress that, that's in it, who's also, I believe, it was her very first movie at like 19 years old. 
but it's about a time machine where he goes back into the past. And he then comes into the future and then goes back to the past again and back and forth and back and forth. And finally he decides he's going to go into the future and he's going to uh, bring with him three books that he takes off of his shelf to go and help this future generation uh, come back to life after the world has been destroyed by a, a gigantic nuclear war, all right? And at the end, um, one of his friends says, looks at the bookshelf and says, there's three books missing. And he says, what three books would you have taken? Well, what's fascinating is we are actually going off into the future to a future, a new earth and a new heaven. And I don't, this is the book. It's in here, <laughs> trust me. I don't have a regular Bible up here or I'd show you. So what happens with this trumpet? Why is this important? Why is this like a timed event? Well, because it's, Paul here in 1 Corinthians says that at the sound, at the last trumpet, and the last trumpet in the Bible is the seventh seal trumpet. Now, as we saw last week, after the seven-year period is completely over, there's another 45 days tacked on to the end by the angel Gabriel in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 12. And he says, if you survive that, you've done good, the last 45 days, to, to get to where there's 1,335 1, days after the Antichrist claims that he is Jesus, that he is God, and he is to be worshipped. And after that, then there will be this mass destruction. The wrath of God will come down. Seven major plagues. One of them is Armageddon, right? No. Remember last week, the movie Armageddon? Okay, with Bruce Willis? No. Armageddon is not the name of the asteroid that's going to hit the earth. It's Wormwood. <laughs> okay. So Wormwood, flies, locusts, boils on our bodies, all kinds of bad things are going to occur, and the Lord is going to bring this upon everybody. And then on the last one, there's the last trumpet is sounded, and then we're raptured. But wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible give us the indication that we may be raptured before all of this happens? Absolutely, and that's why I mentioned the time shift thing. Remember in heaven, right, there is no time. There's only God's present tense, okay? We see that when you read the book of Revelation several times through, and even the book of Daniel, when Daniel, on two different occasions, gets so sick he can't eat or drink anything for three, three weeks, 21 days. The reason is this panorama a prophecies surrounding them, these poor men that are trying to write this down, is so overwhelming because they're seeing so many things happening at the same time. That's why the book of Revelation is not in real chronological order, except for the last three or four books. It's not really one event happening right after another. Do you understand what I'm saying? What is God's name? Do you remember? What did God call himself? Remember to Moses? Moses said, I'm up here on Mount Sinai, I got the Ten Commandments. Okay, the people are going to ask, what is your name? What do I tell them? Who are you? I am. I am that I am. He is continually the present tense. Everything that ever happened is happening and will happen is happening with God right then and there in that spot. Okay, God doesn't have a past. Okay, and you know that because he always existed. So it appears here, the Apostle Paul, and I'm saying it appears, that this last trumpet, that when that sounded, that means the end of the wrath of God is being concluded on all the people left on earth, including the Antichrist, his big army of over 200 million men. And when that happens, we're called up. All right? Now, if you remember I just said in Mark, that he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, 
from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. So it's all those people that have been saved that are in heaven, and those of us that are on earth, that last trumpet's going to sound, and we go to meet him in heaven. And then what happens? Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew him except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's wearing pants, white pants, and a white tunic, on the outside, and he has white hair and a gold belt. The L.A. Lakers' old uniform, their warm-up pants, nylon pants and tops, down the pant leg, okay, it said L.A. Lakers, right down the pant leg on both sides. Now it has, I think, just a logo of Nike or something like that. It's kind of wimpy looking. But it really looked cool because when they're running up and down the court, warming up and shooting baskets and everything, you can see their name from any, any side, left or right, front or back, L.A. Lakers. Jesus is dressed the same way. He's got Lord of Lords and King of Kings going down his leg, from his thigh going down. Okay, probably written in Hebrew, but you'll be able to speak it, no problem. Okay, guaranteed. All right, or Greek. All right, so now he's fully dressed, he's on a white horse, and it says that he's got a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Well, in Job 4.9, Job reminds us, by the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, which is on your sheet here for you to look up later, Isaiah discusses the same thing about the destructive power of God's breath. Okay? The blast of God, with the blast of God, they perish, and by the breath of his anger, they are consumed. There's two Greek words used there, sama and rua. And both of those Greek words, oddly enough, mean a violent, angry breath like that that comes out of a fiery blast furnace, okay? If you remember the book of Daniel, my three teenage, the three teenage buddies of Daniel, right? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar told them to, to worship this golden image that he had created, and they said, no way, Jose. So he said, okay, fine. I'm going to put you in the furnace unless you, unless you worship. And I love their answer. Doesn't make any difference whether you put us in the furnace or not put us in the furnace. We're still not going to worship your, your phony baloney God because we know who our God is. They put him in the furnace. And what happened was when they opened the doors to put Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in there, this blast came out. And in the book of Daniel, it tells us that the two soldiers that were putting him in the furnace were killed instantly. That's it, from the blast of the heat. It was that intense. And then after they got in there, closed the doors, apparently there was some kind of little window, and Nebuchadnezzar could look in there and see that there was four people inside there, right? There was a fourth person walking around and chatting with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And then after they, they eventually came out, it said not only were they not burnt, but there was no smell even of the smoke on their clothing or their turban or their coats or anything. Really cool. 
But this blast is the sword, the sharp sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth. All right? Now I'm setting you up for the, the big finale here. Okay? All right. Flip over to the other side. Jude one fourteen. <clears throat> Jude tells us, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Well, we just saw a moment ago, Jesus is on a white horse, okay, dressed in white, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, down his leg in his uh, really, really fancy warm-up outfit, and all of the saints that came off of planet Earth and those that are already in heaven, right, all dressed in white, the same way, uniform of the day, and they're also on horses. Now, I find this a little disconcerting for me because the last time I was on a horse, I was about seven or eight years old, and I remember it was in Norfolk, Virginia, and my mother put a, a dime, I remember to this day, and I think we're in front of a Piggly Wiggly market, and put a dime, and it was a tan, a little tan colt made of like plastic or you know, Bakelite probably back then before plastic, you know, because I'm old. I'm actually pre-plastic. Okay, <laughs> boom, boom. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we are going to be on horses, and I'm sure by that time we'll know how to ride. Uh, I hope so. I'll ride them. So Jude tells us that Enoch, when we do not have the book of Enoch in the Bible, by the way, but he quotes Enoch as saying, that tens of thousands, now that means millions, okay? That's like saying, you know, quadrillion saints are all coming on horses, following Jesus down. So, as they gather together, meanwhile, in a, in a, in a back room, somewhere off of a dark alley, in an unassuming warehouse, the Antichrist gathers his army to fight. In Zechariah 14, verse 1, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. This is to the Jews. Then he says, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Dun, 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 dun. What's fascinating here is that in all the not all, but many of the prophecy type teachings that I've seen on YouTube, because I like to troll YouTube to see who's on there and what they're saying. They talk about the Battle of Armageddon. Well, we're going to find out in just a moment, there really isn't a battle. The only shot that's fired comes from Jesus. They gather together to take over. They send a contingent into Jerusalem right, that we're going to see in just a moment. But other than that, there really isn't the big massive battle that's expected, but there'll be a surprise. In Revelation 19, it says, I saw the beast, verses 19 to 21, that's the Antichrist, the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to make war against him who sat on the horse, that's the white horse Jesus is sitting on, and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. So this is like a little synopsis given to us in Revelation as to what is just about to happen. So now I'd like everybody to turn to Zechariah 14, because we're right at the very end. Together from 1 Peter 5, 6. Yeah, okay, no more commercials. Okay, here we go. Okay, Zechariah 14. And I'm going to read this right from the very beginning. Are we all there yet? Is 
No, four, 14, chapter 14, verse 1. Okay, so remember the setup. Okay? The angels told, told the apostles, and at that time, according to Luke, later on he tells there were 500 people there that actually witnessed um, Jesus ascend into heaven. Unlike the TV series, the miniseries called The Bible, done by Roma Downey, the actress, they had nine people standing there when Jesus... They must have had a, a bump in their budget, right, Sammy? Because they couldn't hire a lot of extras or even use a computer to put them in there. Nine people, please. Jesus at the time had 120. When the Holy Spirit came on his disciples, 120 received the Holy Spirit. They were able to speak in foreign languages, they were able to heal people and even bring people back from the dead, as we see Paul do, and Peter uh, bringing people, curing illnesses, and a paralytic that he cures outside the temple. And what's really neat, Luke lists the prominent women were also there, and the Holy Spirit came on the women, and the women were able to speak in foreign languages and to heal and to preach, not lead a church, as we see later on, but they actually went out and told their friends, all their Jewish friends. Jesus instructed them what? To preach my gospel, right? Of the repentance and remission of sins, first right here in Jerusalem, then Judea, the territory around Jerusalem, and then what? To the rest of the world. Okay, and we've done that. So now the setup is the Antichrist has gathered at Armageddon a big, massive army in heaven. Jesus tells his angels to get all of my people. Now, remember, when you're in heaven, there's no Jews, there's no Christians. We all belong to Jesus, right? So Jews, Christians, those who profess that Jesus is Lord and there is no other, okay, are gathered together. We mount up on white horses and here he comes. He's coming down. This is the day of the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Okay, so a lot of looting is going to be going on. Half of the city shall go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Sound familiar? Just as the angel said in Acts chapter 1, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, half of it towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. That sounds familiar. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one, and his name is one. All right, the Lord comes back, and he is an earthly king here on planet earth. We're going to see next week, in part three, the conclusion of this exciting adventure story, and it really is, it's a, it's a pretty adventurous one. It's going to get better in just a moment, or worse for the, the Antichrist, unfortunately, or fortunately, that you're, 
you're going to hear about the living waters flowing to the east and to the west. And you're going to hear about a changed earth for about 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. And you're going to see that the rest of the planet is actually literally destroyed. There's nothing alive except this little special territory, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, with Jesus and the temple right in the center of it. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. So peace is going to finally come to planet Earth. Finally come to planet Earth. Now, here's what happened at Armageddon, which is the Valley of Megiddo. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together. Gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. Such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule, on the camel and the donkey, and on all the cattle that will be in those camps. So shall this plague be. They're utterly destroyed, melted like a neutron bomb just went off, killing all the people, but not destroying Jerusalem or the temple. You notice that? That's what neutron bombs do, by the way. So we saw from uh, Isaiah, okay, uh, and also from uh, Job, that this uh, divine blast comes out of the mouth of Jesus like a, a fiery blast furnace and just 200 million men, their animals, equipment, and everything melts. That's it. Done. All right? When you read, I, I made a little note in here. You'll see it in three different places to please read Revelations 19 and also Revelation 20 because in there you will see that right after this occurs, <laughs> an angel of the Lord all right, tells all the birds, it's your time, go down and feast on the corpses of these 200 million, this 200 million man army. And of course, it, it also tells us that, um, that the angels will pluck the Antichrist and also the false prophet alive, and they'll be thrown into the lake of fire, the second death, to which there is no escape whatsoever. Gone. And they're gone. Lastly, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is really cool. The Feast of Tabernacles is usually in, is in, not usually, it is in the fall. It changes just like our Easter changes or our Resurrection Day changes according to the calendar. And it's God living among us, God with us, right? And the Jews will actually, Hasidic or Orthodox Jews in their backyard at their homes will actually construct little booths, you know, to celebrate this, that God is among them. The Feast of Tabernacles, right? So this Feast of Tabernacles is the only feast that's going to be celebrated. It'll be celebrated once a year to recognize that God in the form of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king, is going to be right here on planet Earth with all of us. And the people who survived 
the period of the tribulation, this tribulation period. There will be people that survive. And we're going to see next week what this new Garden of Eden is going to look like. Is there going to be sin there? Who are the people that are going to be left behind? And that's there. So lastly, it says, And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. All right, Cana is where the uh, wicked spiritual arts came from. Modern day gambling, right? Just like rolling dice, the bones that they rolled for the soldiers rolled for Jesus's tunic is basically his underwear rather that was all woven in one piece at the foot of the cross, right? And also worshiping the stars, astrology, okay? Back then it was called astronomy, believe it or not. And astrology up until this last hundred years was, they were, they were flip-flopped. Now astronomy is the study of the stars and astrology, which in Greek actually means the study of the stars. But that's switched and now becomes to these special charts and everything else to try to divine your future. I have one last verse in conclusion, and it's in Revelation chapter 20. It's at the very bottom of your little sheet here. And it's, uh, I encourage you to read, we don't have time to read uh, the, the, the full chapter 20 of Revelation, but basically it tells us that uh, Satan the one, the only bad person that's left is thrown into the abyss and locked in there with a chain and a big, and a big padlock by uh, an archangel, one of the warrior angels, a cherub, and locks him up for a thousand years because we, the saints, are going to reign and rule with Jesus on this new planet Earth and the new uh, Garden of Eden. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Part three, next week, don't miss it, all right? Because we're going to see how the saints are going to reign and rule with Jesus for a thousand years. We're going to see something that answers a lot of questions about, well, wait a minute, are we going to have sin? Yes, I'll give you a little heads up. We're going to have the sin that is common to mankind, as the Apostle Paul tells us, okay? And that is, there will still be lying, there will still be people cheating, okay? There will be people stealing and individual acts of anger and distrust and even murder. Will there be wars? No. And you're going to see from Isaiah that he tells us that there's going to be no more wars, no more serial killers, no more demonic type controlled massive killings like we're seeing. Recently, a person in the news told the police after he killed this woman uh, at the beach, he said that uh, a demon was controlling him. He actually believed that. And so many of these killers we see actually commit suicide after they've killed a number of people in a mass shooting uh, at a school or other places, right? So we're going to have a life that's going to be 
ruled by Jesus himself personally. It's going to be strict. But this is, as I told you last Wednesday, that this is the last chance for the people that have survived on earth after the Antichrist. This is their last chance to recognize Jesus and to be saved. And after this, all bets are off. That's it. We all go to be with Jesus in a new heaven and a new earth. So thank you for listening. And I'll see you next week. And I went over eight minutes. Oh, are there any? <laughs> but of course. Thank you, Ed McMahon. I really appreciate that. Are there any questions? Please, at least one. No? All right. Yes, ma'am. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I do know that it's, it's not just there. It's also in, it's in Thessalonians. It's also here in Corinthians that it happens in the twinkle of an eye. And most scientists say a twinkle of an eye is a nanosecond, one ten thousandth of a second. You're gone. Just like that. Now, remember the movies from the 80s? I don't know. You look too young maybe to remember those. The left behind movies and those things, right? They show a, they'll show a, a lady's, they'll show a lady's pair of shoes and maybe her dress and a string of pearls laying on the ground. You know, of course they don't show any underwear or wallet or a purse or anything. I guess she takes all of that stuff with her. But uh, yes, that's that we just all go. Jesus, by the way, we know, and Elijah, we know, actually, he went up, he was wearing his clothes. He had everything with him. He was just, that's it. He just went, right? So, yes, ma'am. In what you talked about tonight, during the thousand-year reign? No, the thousand-year reign is after Jesus comes down on the Mount of Olives. That begins the thousand years. When Jesus comes down onto the Mount of Olives on his horse, okay, and kills the Antichrist and his army, right, at that point, the thousand-year clock starts running. So, will, the, will those that are saved go back to heaven? Because we won't be here during those thousand years. Yes, we will. We, we'll be here. We'll be here. And we'll, and we'll have, probably have the ability to go back and forth. But uh, we'll see in the New Testament that, uh, that the Lord mentions that to the Jews, that he's going to send pastors from among the Gentiles, meaning teachers and leaders from among the Gentiles that will teach these people all things about himself. And I hope I'm one of those. I, I know Ken will be. Okay. Yeah. are the ones who have been killed for their belief. Is that true? Yeah, it is. They will. Not but not just, no, it doesn't, not but that could also include us, okay? But it says, it says here that, that those that take part in the first resurrection, okay, that means that any of us who are saved by believing in Jesus. Okay, not necessarily those you see in the book of Revelation. I know what you're saying, that are martyred for the faith. And there are those, in your little notes from last week, I gave you a quote in there. I think it's from Revelation 14, right? I'm pretty sure Revelation chapter 14. We see that there are people that will be saved during the tribulation period. They'll probably lose their heads over it because they won't take the mark of the beast. They're all part of the first resurrection. So we're all in this group, not just, not just people that are killed during the tribulation period. No, no. No, all of us together. Okay. Now, here's what's interesting. It tells us here that those that are, I don't want to use the term prejudged, but there are those who are dead that will remain in the graves, that will not arise when we have the, um, the rapture. 
They will just stay in the graves, okay? Because after the thousand years, right, it tells us at the rest, that's why I ask you to please read not only Revelation 19, but read all of Revelation 20, because it'll answer your question. In the, right after this portion here about reigning for a thousand years, it talks about the great white throne judgment. And it says that the sea will give up her dead, Hades, hell, will give up its dead, and all the graves will be opened, and this is the second resurrection, and they will all come up, and everyone will kneel in front of Jesus and proclaim that he is the Son of God, he is Christ, the King, the Messiah, okay? And then they will be judged, and that's where it goes on in the, in the book of Revelation that he separates the, the, the sheep from the goats, okay? And so those people, unfortunately, because it appears that they're, they're pretty much, they weren't part of the first resurrection. So they're brought up in front of Jesus to be judged, and then they don't stay in heaven. They go off to the second death, which is the lake of fire. All right? But yeah, they're, and this, this thousand year is the last chance for people that are actually alive walking around that aren't dead, okay, to get that. Now we do know, we do know if you read Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19, you read about the rich man who goes to hell, okay? So think of hell, Gehenna, okay, or Hades as being like county jail, all right? And he's in county jail, and he doesn't bail out. He doesn't get any bail. And he's there until he has an arraignment and a trial in front of the judge, Jesus. And then he gets his sentence, and then that sentence is eternal life imprisonment with no parole in the lake of fire, which is like the state penitentiary, right? Okay, so he goes from... Hell inside the earth, which, by the way, is going to be destroyed at the end. All right. And then he goes off into the lake of fire with everybody else that doesn't follow Jesus. All right. Now, that's I know it sounds very cold, doesn't it? And it sounds very cruel, but it's not. No, it's a gift. It's a gift, you know, and it's free. And all you have to do. I know all of you are saved. This is, a, I'm preaching to the choir here, you know. But Pastor Ken is right, you know. It's a free gift. All you have to do is acknowledge God's greatness, goodness, and love for us, all right? And humble yourself and admit that you're flawed, deeply flawed, and a sinner. And that's it. My favorite verse is what I call the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. That's Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, right? Okay, does anybody know it? That's right. You trust in the Lord with all your heart, and in all your ways acknowledge Him. Okay? And if you do that, and place absolute faith, confidence, and trust in Jesus Christ, okay? Game on. You're with the Lord. And that's it. And the best part is, wait, there's more, okay? This doesn't come with a lifetime guarantee. It comes with an after-lifetime guarantee, all right? And it means that as long as you follow his commands and ask for his help, okay? He is with you always. He'll never abandon you. He will never leave us as orphans. He will always be there for us, personally, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's something you can actually take to the bank, all right? How many people here have a concordance? Do you have a concordance, like a Strong's concordance? I want you to do something tonight and report back next Wednesday. Okay, Derek and Sammy and the lady in the back. Okay, go to John 3, 16. All right, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes, right, in him. I want you to look up the word believes, right? A very wishy-washy English word. Oh, I believe it's going to rain tomorrow. 
you know, oh, but I believe in God. Look it up and you're going to find something very fascinating. You're going to see the Greek word pisteo, which means to have full confidence in trust in the same you would for putting your money in the bank. Look it up and then report back and tell me the different definitions that you get for that, okay? It's going to be fascinating. So it's not just, oh, I believe God, you know, right? Or my favorite, Joel Olstein. You know, all you have to do is just, just believe that Jesus is God. And once you do that, God will love you and take care of you. Yeah. Except he forgot that also it tells us in the New Testament that the demons believe that Jesus is Lord and they tremble. Right? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm on a roll. Sorry, Pastor Ken. I had a Pastor Ken moment here, so I'm going to step down. <laughs> Well, it gets a little hard to get all these facts straight, you know, but the next event's the rapture, you know. We're looking forward to that. That could happen at any moment. We pray that Jesus will come soon. And then at some point after that, you know, the tribulation will be. You know, it doesn't say that the rapture happens on Monday and the tribulation starts on Tuesday, you know. We don't know. There could be some time period in there before that seven-year period begins. Uh, during that seven-year period, uh, there will be, uh, and Revelation 7, I think, is what she's looking for. There's going to be billions of people saved. I think billions, maybe millions, but there's going to be and a list there, every tribe and tongue and nation. So you'll have uh, all those uh, folks that will be saved uh, in that time period, but many will not. And if you do get saved in that time period, you're probably going to pay for it with your life. Um, and, but those folks that survive, and, and I've heard one person say that every believer will be killed in the tribulation, but their kids uh, that they may have, they will survive, and they will move into at some point whenever the millennium comes. And uh, those folks are like us. You know, they're sinners like us. They'll need to be saved like us, uh, like now. Now, you won't be here. You'll be, you know, raptured out. You'll be up in heaven. You'll be whatever we're doing up there at that point, you know. Um, and then the, that during that thousand-year reign, those children will grow up. They will get married. They will have children. I think there will be a, a great population explosion. But they still have to become believers. Some choose not to do that, right? Uh, and that's why there's, there's some that, that commit crimes and so forth, as he mentioned. But if you're saved, you won't be a sinner. You will be a purified like Jesus person, you will not be uh, uh, able to sin because you're freed from that when you receive Christ and you're up in heaven, you had that new glorified body. Uh, and you'll have responsibilities, I think, to do, as we've talked about, to do in, in the millennium. And then uh, that will come to an end, though. And, and you, what you heard here tonight, that sounds horrible, but listen, it's not what God wanted, is it? What does the Bible say? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he wants people to be saved. He wants, he says, uh, he wants all people, you know, but he gives us that choice. And some people choose not to be saved. And finally, what, what this is about is the final, finally God's patience is out. <laughs> oh, it's over. Okay, I've given you a chance, a chance, a chance to be saved. Uh, you said no, no, no to me. All right, well then, you know, your, your attack on my people, Jerusalem and so forth, that's it, you know. But God is a God of love and forgiveness and mercy, and he wants people to come to repentance. But he doesn't force them, right? He doesn't force anyone to be saved. Um, and so it would be interesting to learn what we have to learn next week about that thousand-year reign upon the earth of Christ, and we will see him physically, we will converse with him, and we'll have responsibilities, and it's going to be a, a Garden of Eden-like experience. But I like the way you said that. It's the last chance for mankind to come. And then after that, time ends. You know, God started time, and he will end time. And after that thousand-year reign is over, time is over, and then we begin eternity future for us. And boy, that, what's that going to be like, you know? 
and we think, okay, how, how can there not be time? Well, there will not be time. And so, and believe me, it will not be boring. It will be exciting. It will be interesting. It will be, we'll be growing and learning and it will have, I think, a lot of responsibilities as well. All right? Well, that was good. Uh, so um, let's just have prayer together. And uh, thank you for be being with us here tonight. And so, Charles, good to see you again. And so uh, if you would bow your heads with me, please, and uh, let's go to prayer. We'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we look forward to the return of Christ. We hope that it will be very soon. And Lord, th this world is so troubled, it is so sinful, it is becoming more rebellious against you. We seem so ignorant of your word and your love and your goodness and your grace. We seem so bent on turning from you as a people, as a world, and just even this month is Gay Pride Month. And Lord, you've said that we to repent of sin and turn from our evil ways and you will forgive us and cleanse us. And so I pray that you would, as, as we have a nation here that's turning from you, that you would restore us back to you. Give us leaders that know you. And Father, I pray that you would just help our church to be effective this week as we witness as we invite people to church, as we give out tracts, as, as we live out the Christian life, may people see Jesus in us. I pray, Father, that you would help us in this building project, that the money will be provided, that you will be honored through this, and this will become a real tool uh, to do your work. Uh, Lord, I think many times I wish we had it to do various things, and so I pray that you would provide this. I pray for Stan and Jackie Sherwood in Panama as they try to build their new building, that that will go well. We pray for Debbie and Steve Poston as they try to build that orphanage in Mexico. Uh, God, that that will go well. We pray, Father, for the Keefs there in Australia as they start this new church, that God, you would use them there. And Lord, we may pray for all of our other missionaries. I think of the Fangs in China, and they're doing their work. Uh, Lord, it's, it's risky somewhat. We pray you protect them. I pray for uh, the Hayes, Father Miss Hayes, as she's in the Philippines. And God, I pray also for our dear Pam Quinlan as she lost her husband to COVID this last fall, that you would help her to know where to go back to the Philippines. And we pray for the Rouches as they try to get back to Zambia, that that would go quickly, and you'd work there. And all of our other missionaries, God, I pray your hand upon them. Bless these folks here and the needs that they may have. Give my dear wife healing. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right. You are